I think far too often, far too many agents leave it to hope. They think, oh, well, you know, the buyer will either come up or the, the seller will get realistic or whatever term they want to use. We realise that really that's our job. You know, we can't sit there and hope for anything. It's up to us to get that deal done. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for Real Estate Industry Sales Professionals, Property Managers and Leaders. With thanks to our partner Connect Now, Elevate brings you the best tools, thinking and strategies to elevate your results. To download your written action guide from this podcast containing extra tips, links and shortcuts, visit EliteAgentElevate.com. And for more information about how Connect Now can make moving easier on your clients, Visit connectnow.com.au. Here is your host, Samantha McLean. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate podcast, where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate for the very best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Samantha McLean, editor of Elite Agent and host of this week's show. Today, I am joined by Drew Davies, who many will be familiar with as a million dollar Brisbane agent who built a pretty decent following on Instagram. Speaking of which, he has over 32,000 followers on, on that platform. And after seven years in real estate, he now heads up his own business as principal of Place Estate Agents in Ascot, Brisbane. Drew, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Samantha. It's a privilege. Yeah, it's, well, it's amazing. We did a little interview with you last year and everyone was very interested to hear more about how you built your social media presence. So it's phenomenal to get you here. And I think we've got a fair bit of ground to cover today because your journey into real estate is pretty interesting in itself. And then obviously we've got a bit of brand building to talk to you about. But before real estate, I believe you studied architecture and worked in human resources. And your introduction to sales was via Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. So can you share a little bit of that whole adventure before real estate? Yeah, so I did study architecture. I was never a registered architect, but I did work in architecture for seven years. I was never going to be the world's best architect. Uh, A lot of the money was sort of drawing high rises and things which really didn't excite me at all. So moved out of that. I read The Wolf of Wall Street in about 2008, I think it was, and decided, right, sales is the life for me, and moved into recruitment. And look, I was a pretty lousy salesperson, to be quite honest. My training wasn't great. I probably had a little bit of unjustified ego, And I I just really didn't excel. And then it was through meeting Jordan and doing training with him and meeting someone through that meeting that started my career in real estate. And that all happened on a flight to LA to actually meet with Jordan, sitting next to a gentleman who was in real estate. So can you tell us a little bit about how you segued into real estate? Yeah. And I've told the story a few times, so I'll keep it short, but Jordan reached out to a few people, a lot of people. He basically blanket hired, you know, there's probably, I don't know, 100, 200 people to be his little minions and go around and sell tickets to his seminars in Australia. So he essentially ended up firing all of them, bar me and this one guy, Nick. And we ended up selling a truckload of these tickets. I think we basically equaled what Ticketek sold. We sold a lot of tickets. I can't remember what it was. And Jordan was blown away. So as a bit of a thank you, he bought us tickets to LA to stay with him and his family. And on that flight there, I got talking to Nick. We didn't really know each other at that stage. And I was just asking what he did. And he was in sales, selling house and land packages to a lot of the Chinese. So he'd hold seminars in China and sell a lot of that product. And I was just asking, I was just being cheeky and asking what he earned. And, you know, I was absolutely floored when he told me what he earned. And he was, I think he's six years younger than me. So I literally decided on that flight, that's it. I'm becoming a real estate agent. And that was it as of that day. Yeah. And so tell me, once you'd made that decision, what was the next step for you? So the next step was getting my license, obviously, and then finding a place to work. And it was one of those stories. I'd met a guy at a party a couple of months earlier. He owned a boutique agency. He's like, yeah, of course, I've got a desk in my office. And it just started from there. I didn't even have a car at the time. So I definitely did not set the real estate world on fire from day one, put it that way. Yeah. How long did it take you to actually hit your stride in real estate? It took me coming close to bankruptcy before I got a sale. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I would say, I can't remember the amount of time. I remember the day that I realized it was going to work out, but I don't remember how much time. It was probably around that year mark. 
I had the best of both worlds because I was nearly broke. And I, I mean broke, paying rent on a credit card. And I had a really big commission hit the bank, you know, like a really big commission. So it was the best of both worlds. I had the pain and then the pleasure and that was it. So obviously you remember your first listing very well. How did you get that first one away? Well, that one wasn't my first listing. That was, you know, a while down the track. But my first listing was just, it was on the market. It had been on the market for a year. And then I managed to wrangle that out of the hands of the poor agent who had been working it for a year and took it over. And I think that first listing took me two years to sell. Yeah. So the first listing still took two years to sell. Yeah, not a raging success story. Yeah, I was going to say, so that must give some new agents that might be listening to this some heart, is that it just, it, there are no overnight successes pretty much, are there? Well, I certainly wasn't one, there may be. Yeah. You came into Brisbane in an area that was pretty much dominated by somebody else, so it must have been kind of, well, scary a little bit too, given your situation. How did you make inroads into such a tough market? I guess not having any friends or contacts in the industry probably helped me because I didn't know any better. So every day I just woke up, cold called, door knocked, just on repeat, day upon day upon day. And I started selling in the CBD because I didn't have a car and I figured, well, I have to walk to as many appointments as possible. So that just made sense. Keeps you fit too. Keeps me fit. <laughs> and, but I always had my eye on the prize of Ascot. Everyone always talked about Ascot having the biggest homes. I knew nothing about the area at the time, but that was always goal number one. So it took me about two or three years to eventually sell something in that suburb. Your first luxury listing, I think, was an apartment. How did you manage to secure that one? It probably was, but it depends what you call luxury at the time. That was a property I ended up selling for 1.24. So it's not really really luxury, but to me that was that – that next level of apartment where I knew if I could get one away above a million dollars, I could leapfrog into that level of, you know, luxury apartment in Brisbane. And for that one, I was actually selling the property next door to it, which was, you know, $550,000. And every time I'd hold an open home, I'd just write a little handwritten note and drop it under her door, just saying, look, we had this many people through the open home. This is what we're seeing in the market. If I can ever be of assistance, nothing out of the ordinary. And just persistence. And she rang me one day and I signed that up, sold it through social media. And that was back in about 2015. So sold it through Instagram to someone who was living in Abu Dhabi or Dubai, one of the two. And through that, the sellers of that apartment turned around at the end of the process and said, you simply have to talk to my daughter. She's trying to sell her home in Hamilton. And that was the house that basically kickstarted my career when I sold that house. Nowadays, like you've got quite a lot of celebrity clients on the books. I think you sold Darius Boyd's property. I did. Uh, and for people who aren't football fans, he used to play for St George and a few other teams. The um, Broncos. <laughs> I the Broncos. <laughs> St George is the only one that matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> you're sort of new to real estate or you're thinking to yourself, geez, I, I really would like to go for that market. What are some tips on being able to attract that sort of client? I think you have to understand yourself and where you sit in the market first and foremost. I think everyone has certain times in their career where they think, oh, I would love to sell high-priced homes and have celebrity clients. But I mean, at that level, sometimes I look at people in the outer suburbs selling five, $400,000 houses a week, and it seems like they're just putting a sign up and sending out contracts. And sometimes I look at those people and think, oh, geez, that, that seems like a pretty cool gig as well. So you've got to work out what makes you happy. Quite often, these deals are quite long and lengthy and arduous when they are these higher priced properties. So I I think being honest with yourself and deciding what you're really wanting to do with your career is probably goal number one. But if you do decide that it's dealing with the higher end, then I think you have to be comfortable with the fact that it takes a very, very long time to nurture these relationships. Nothing happens quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And then you've got confidentiality and all sorts of things. Exactly. Very, very tricky. Let's talk non-confidential. Let's talk Insta and social media. You're the most followed agent in Australia on Instagram and you've also just recently acquired some sponsorships on the platform as well. So how did you start building your social media presence like way back when you started? So out of necessity really, 
because when I very first started, I, I had no money to market myself. And when you're selling apartments, it's actually quite expensive because you have to do a lot of direct mail. So I didn't have a lot of money for that. So I figured, so it came out of necessity. I thought, look, here's sort of guerrilla marketing tactic that I can implement straight away. So it was born out of necessity. It was just a very good time in the market to get on that platform. I think I started in 2014 or 15, essentially the day I started my real estate career and just built it from there. And it was just consistency. I took some good advice from someone who was quite big in that space at the time. And he said, just consistent posting is all it takes. Invest in a camera, buy a nice camera, make sure the photos are good looking and make it consistent. So that's what I did. And it was twice a day for a long, long time. Now it's a little bit different. It's once every three or four days. Yeah. And what sort of things would you post in the beginning? I didn't have luxury property to post, that was for sure. <laughs> so it was literally the only thing I could think of at the time was every morning I'd get a coffee and I'd sit in the same spot. So I'd take a photo of my coffee and the socks I was wearing. And as crazy as that sounds, at that point in time, it gained a lot of momentum. And, you know, I gained a lot of followers that way. And I very quickly had, you know, 6,000 followers. And when I got around that five or 6,000 followers, socks just started turning up at the office in the mail. <laughs> and then when it got to sort of that 10,000 follower, I had brands reaching out to me. I think that's, you know, around that 10 or 20,000 mark BMW reached out to me and wanted to do some paid advertising. You know, you've got to be very choosy with the brands you work with, but it's snowballed since then. Yeah, it's interesting. Even something as simple as socks, I'm sure people were just, they would be wondering what socks you were wearing next. Yeah, oh, look, I still get messages now. I, I mean, I never post socks anymore. It's just, it, it doesn't occupy any of my mind space. I have a wife, children, and an office with staff to look after. I mean, socks are the furthest thing from my mind. <laughs> yeah. But I, I guess that's a part of the reason that my following has grown is because a lot of the people that follow me have been there since very early in my career when I wasn't successful. So being very honest throughout the journey has kept a lot of those people invested. If you had to just rattle off three or four tips for agents that wanted to build their Instagram presence, what would you tell them? First and foremost, consistency, because it's the one thing everyone struggles with. They come out of the gates hard when they decide that they're going to invest time in social media. And then sure enough, a week, two weeks later, it tapers off. But that's because they're not being authentic. If you're being authentic, it should be really easy to post because you should be posting about things that happen in your life, no matter how perceivably boring you may think they are you will find a following. I think you've got to pay to play. You, you've got to make that decision that we're living in the world now where if you want to be followed on social media, unfortunately, nowadays, you have to pay. And that's how you get eyeballs on your page. So for me, I do a lot of my advertising for properties through Instagram and Facebook, obviously, same platform. But I think consistency, you've got to pay. If you're not advertising your properties on Instagram, you have to start. And I think a big one, and I only say this because I meet or I have met with a lot of people who have come to me for advice about social media in the past. You've got to leave the ego at the door and stop worrying about what people think of you. You know, of that 30 something thousand followers I have, I can guarantee you there is at least a small portion of those people that are watching, making fun of me or waiting for me to fail. And that's fine. That's part of it. And you've got to not worry about those people. I think we did an interview with Amy Callister a, a couple of weeks back where she said, if you're on social media just for the likes, you're on it for the wrong reason. You've got to change your view and, and just be there to help people. Well, you've got to have a goal. Right? And, and if you're going to push your social media side of the business because your goal is to have more likes or more followers, I mean, that's a pretty flawed goal because there's no outcome there. It should always be about getting your client a better result, a quicker result, and therefore increasing your own revenue. And if, if you can work backwards from that and figure out how to do it, you'll figure out pretty quickly it doesn't come down to your amount of followers. With marketing property on Instagram, what do you think is better at the moment, stories or the newsfeed? It's a constantly changing animal. So I try not to give too much advice on this because if I give advice on what's happening right now, it could change next week. I get the most benefit from stories. So if I have a property and I do a little walkthrough, nothing exciting, not a talk to camera piece, but just a little walkthrough, drop some cool music over the top with a swipe up link to one of the portals. Sometimes I'll probably, I can get up to 500 click throughs from that. Now, if you look at the average amount of people that view a realestate.com ad or a domain.com.au ad, it's 
you know, probably what, five, 6,000 the first week you launch for an average property, something like that. To add 500 on top of that within the space of a few hours, that's a big difference. So that's something I try and do quite often without sort of flooding my audience with that stuff, but it can be a big help. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask that. Your proportion of marketing property to being a real person, what sort of percentage would you say is good enough to be able to market property but not annoy everyone in the process, if you know what I mean? Again, it comes down to your goal that you set why you're pushing into social media. So for me, at this point in my career, I like my Instagram for the fact that my clients can log on at any point in time and they see how I live my life when I'm not selling property. And hopefully it should align with everything I tell them in my professional life. You know, I'm not at the pub, I'm not out drinking, I'm not usually really doing anything but hanging out with my, my family or selling real estate. And for that reason, you know, a question I get quite often is, should I have a professional page and a personal page? I don't think you should. I think it should just be one. Mm, I agree with you, actually. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going out and drinking because if you did that, you're still going to have a portion of the market who want to use you. Who will relate to the going to the pub. Again, it circles back to just being authentic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about some of the properties that you've marketed because one of the more famous properties recently was that Skateball House in Hamilton. Mm. So tell me a bit about that campaign and how you thought through that one. So very, very peculiar house because it did have, you know, a seven, eight foot deep concrete skateboard bowl in the house, not a miniature one, you know, a full size concrete skateboard bowl in the living room. And the owner was really toying with the idea of just acting like it wasn't there. He didn't want to take photos of it. He just wanted me to sort of talk people through it when they turned up. You know, it was something we had to harness and use to our advantage because that is what was going to give us the publicity. And I genuinely thought there may be people out there who were going to absolutely want it for that reason. But I was shocked at the amount of people that did want it for that exact reason. The amount of skateboarders who had done well in their lives and wanted to circle back and buy a house with a skate bowl in it. I mean, if you're a skateboarder, who doesn't want that? So we utilised that in the video. You know, I jumped in that video myself, tore through a couple of suits, um, tore my calf muscle as well. But it did get a lot of coverage and a lot of leverage. We got a live interview off Sunrise because of them seeing that through social media. Because obviously once you've got that asset of the video, you do sponsor it and push it into certain places throughout Australia. Just goes to prove really that for every house, there is a group of buyers. You've just got to pick the right feature of the house to promote. Absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, I was shocked. Like I said, there's probably three or four people, including someone who's extremely famous, who showed interest in that house, skateboarders who had done very well. Yeah. I've heard it mentioned that, or you mentioned rather, that you've compressed your current career into about two or three years. Like you've done a lot in the last couple of years. What would your advice be to agents who are just starting out now, particularly in the area of mindset? Because I know that's a hot topic of yours. Yeah, it is. Because especially in an industry where everyone's so intent on showing people how well they're doing, it can be very discouraging for people who are new to the industry. And I'm really mindful that a lot of people actually get put off the industry because they think everyone else is doing so much better than them, when in reality, they're not. It's a really twisted industry. But look, I think... Time management, I mean, really basic stuff. Time management, I see a lot of people who think they're busy. They say, I'm too busy for this, I'm too busy for that. Get up earlier. I'm up at 4, 4.30 every single day. Now, and, and I'm not the best time manager in the world, but if I need to go to the gym, it gets done at 5.30 to 6.30. If I need to spend time with my boys, it gets done from 6.30 until 7.30. I'm still in the office at 8. I'm still there till 6 or 7. You know, So time management, no matter how busy you think you are, you're probably not interesting isn't it that it is just really about making those non-negotiable appointments with the people that you love as well as you work exactly I, I see a real difference in agents you have the agent who is always thinking about well I just need to get this done so I can go watch the game or I can go meet my friends or I can go do this whereas all the good agents I know all of that gets put on the back burner you know, I've got to set this appointment, close this deal, because that's going to lead to two more that I might have to go to at nine o'clock tonight. You know, two very, very different mindsets. You've built yourself a pretty awesome team as well in the last couple of years. So tell me how that started out and what that looks like now. Yeah, both of those people came through Instagram as well in my personal team. So in addition to my personal team, we've hired plenty of people who have been attracted to 
Pat, my business partner, and myself through social media. I recruited my wife through social media. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think, again, just like clients getting to see how I operate day to day, it's good for other agents to understand how I operate. And a lot of those agents, after watching me for six months, a year, two years, decide that, hey, that's something I align with. I might reach out to Drew and see if that's something I can be a part of. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the alignment's not there, but quite often it is. And with Carter and Olivia, that alignment is just absolutely perfect. That's interesting, actually, because what you're saying there is it doesn't just attract clients, but it's actually an attraction strategy for building a team that you will attract the people that will naturally gel well with you. Yeah, because if if agents are being honest with themselves, the majority of people who follow agents on social media are other agents. So (laughs) the minute you get comfortable with that and understand it, you may as well use it to your advantage. Yeah, yeah. It is quite a phenomenon, isn't it? It is. Yeah. If you could give your younger self any pieces of advice, what would it be? Probably just to work harder. I spent a lot of my life thinking, like I said, thinking I was busy, thinking I was working hard. And it wasn't until I found any sort of success in real estate that I really understood what it was to throw yourself into something completely. So I wouldn't try and rethink the world. I'd just try and work harder. And what's on the agenda for you this year? Personally or professionally? Oh, both. Both. (laughs) Can we go both? Look, obviously I'd like to build the team. I think we've got about, what, 22, 23 staff all together at the moment. You know, I'd like to get a couple of more in there. There's a couple of agents we're working on at the moment, which I think would be perfect. My personal team, obviously, the goal is always to do bigger and better business. And then personally, personally, I'm pretty comfortable. I'm pretty happy. I don't have huge ambitions. I don't need, you know, sometimes I find myself wanting a new car and then I think, who cares? No. So look, personally, I'm happy. I think business-wise, we're always looking to grow and expand. Yeah. And I have to ask you about the picture behind you. Obviously, that's the Monopoly guy. Is there a story behind that? Yeah, this is a, a painting that my wife had commissioned for me. And, and, you know, she rounded up a few of my mates and they all chipped in and bought that for me, which is really nice. So it takes pride position in my office. Um, and it's got a few things in there that relate to real estate. My two boys, Harvey and Franklin, and my wedding in Vegas and a few things. So yeah, it's, it's pretty special. Well, you need a bit of luck in real estate too, right? Yeah, you do. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Drew, it's been fantastic chatting to you and getting to know you. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. If there was one thing that you'd like to leave our listeners with, what would it be? It's always such a tough question, isn't it? I know, right? I'll tell you what, I, someone said something to me many years ago and it helped me close a listing that week And that was about four years ago. And I just used that same phrase circulating around in my head to close a deal this week. And it's hope is not a strategy. And as simple as it sounds, that one phrase has helped me close two very big deals, one four years ago and one this week. Are you talking about the vendor, hope not being a strategy for the vendor? Yeah, just the the whole negotiation based around that. And I think far too often, far too many agents leave it to hope. They think, oh, well, you know, the, the buyer will either come up or the the seller will get realistic or whatever term they want to use. When realize that really that's our job. You know, we can't sit there and hope for anything. It's up to us to get that deal done. Yeah, and follow the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Drew Davies, thank you so much. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Sam Hatter. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Elevate with thanks to connectnow.com.au. Don't forget to download your written action guide from this podcast containing extra tips, links and shortcuts. Visit eliteagentelevate.com.